Hello and welcome to the second webinar in our series, Adapting Stormwater Management for a Changing Climate Workshop. Um, <clears throat> this is the second of four webinars preceding an actual in-person workshop that we'll be having in DC in March. Um, our uh, speaker today is Mark Maimoni, who's a Senior Vice President of CDM Smith. Uh, but before I introduce Mark, I'll uh, we'll just mention this workshop is sponsored by CC Run, the Consortium for Climate Risks in the Urban Northeast. We are a NOAA-funded RESA, uh, Regional Integrated Science and Assessment Program of, um, of NOAA, and we conduct stakeholder-driven research uh, focusing on climate change in the urban Northeast. Um, <clears throat> so this webinar is part of, as I mentioned, a workshop that we are conducting to gather information and sort of the state of the science in terms of how uh, how we can develop IDF curves, time series, other products that are useful to water utilities and stormwater utilities as they plan um, for wet weather events now and in the future. And um, so the, the full workshop is on March 5th and March 6th at Drexel's Washington DC um, campus and you can look at the bottom of the screen right now that's the um, that's the link uh, if you're interested in registering also if you look uh, up at the top left of the screen you see pre-workshop webinars so if you're joining us for the first time this month I mean this this for this webinar last week's webinar and this webinar and the future webinars will all be posted uh, at that link so you can if you missed Mark's presentation last week. You can go there now and watch it in its entirety. And um, you can also spread the word about this webinar and the, the, the next two um, with that link. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, this is the second uh, webinar that Mark gave. The last one was focusing on uh, daily GCM precipitation output and its use in hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. And uh, this webinar will be focusing on a stochastic weather generator that Mark's team has developed, uh, which he'll be talk talking to us about in a second. But just as a highlight, next week we have Dr. Zhiwen Yu from the University of Florida. And, um, and then February 13th, we have Egan, Eric Rosenberg and Art DiGaetano from Cornell University uh, will be presenting uh, additional work. Again, for those of you who are uh, professional engineers looking for PDH credits in Pennsylvania, New York, or New Jersey, well, for Pennsylvania and New York, um, we can issue a certificate of completion to you. Just please type your name and email address into the chat window. Um, we have other states pending. Um, so if you're interested and you're in another state, uh, let us know and we will uh, see how things go uh, going forward. So today's speaker, Dr. Mark Maimoni, uh, this is a picture of him wearing his other hat as a professional cellist, but he is a senior water resource uh, management specialist with CDM Smith. Um, at least that's what he is for us today. Um, his academic background involves um, uh, bachelor's in civil engineering, master's in environmental and regional planning, and PhD in water resource planning from the University of Groningen. Uh, and he's got over 30 years of experience in groundwater and surface water management, water quality, urban water management, and modeling of ground and surface water with many publications. And so uh, Dr. Maimoni has been working with Philadelphia Water Department quite a bit on, uh, on this topic. And so with that, I will hand it over to Mark uh, to get into the technical presentation of today's webinar. Great, thank you, Franco. Uh, Mark, while you're getting your uh, screen ready, let me just mention to everyone on the webinar, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, um, you can just type them in through that Q&A box and I will um, feed them over to, our, uh, to Franco and to uh, Mark at the end of the webinar. Or if you would like to verbally ask your question, there is a raise your hand um, button also at the bottom of your screen, and I can unmute you so that you can um, ask your question verbally. So when we get into the Q&A uh, section, then those are the two ways that you'll be able to participate. Thank you, Corin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to give this second seminar, uh, webinar, uh, 
I'm going to be talking about a stochastic weather generator, a practical one that we developed for the Philadelphia Water Department as part of their climate adaptation program. Um, my co-authors and people that have worked with me on this project, Julia Rockwell, um, she heads up the climate adaptation program at the Philadelphia Water Department. And uh, Sebastian Malter, who's now with CDM Smith, um, but at the time also was a, uh, with the Water Department uh, working on this, on this project. Um, I did give a webinar last week, Tuesday. Uh, many of you, or hopefully some, uh, many of you heard it. Uh, for the ones who, who haven't, I'm just going to take about three or four minutes just to make sure that what we concluded and, and presented last week um, is in this webinar so that um, it, the, the rest of it, what follows, will be a little bit more understandable. So. Um, we, we looked at um, global climate model output um, and we compared it with the Philadelphia rain gauge and we, we showed a bunch of statistics <clears throat> to prove our point, but we, we drew a number of conclusions which I think are important and are fairly universally true for um, a global climate model output. Um, and that is that they do a, a, a pretty good job on an annual and maybe even a seasonal basis when you're totaling up their precipitation volume. So in Philly, we get about 44 inches. If you look at the models, they also give about 44 inches. Um, but once you get below a uh, seasonal, uh, even monthly, um, they begin to get fairly inaccurate. And when they uh, give daily precipitation volumes, which they do, you can get a daily uh, precipitation time series starting in 1950 and running all the way through 2099, um, the results are pretty poor in comparison to what actually happens. Uh, they under, uh, underestimate um, quite a bit um, the daily rainfall totals and they overestimate how many times it rains per year. So that's how they get the annual correct. They, they underestimate the, uh, the intensity by about half and then they have about twice as many rainy days per year as actually occur. Um, so that makes using their daily output for any kind of urban stormwater uh, application um, useless. Um, and so th the point is that you have to do something with that output in order to be able to uh, use it for, for modeling of urban systems. Um, so we, uh, we, de we developed an approach to do that. The essence of it, of course, is, is not to try to adjust the uh, global climate model output, the precipitation output, um, but to use it to assess uh, the potential change factors that might occur and then apply them to an actual rain gauge hourly time series. Uh, and we showed how that was done uh, and how effective it could be in producing a future projected time series. Um, it goes something like this. Um, you develop uh, what we call delta change factors. Um, but there are a few key uh, things that we presented last week that are really important. Um, one, you should not use the delta change factors based on the change in the volume, uh, inches, millimeters, whatever, um, because as I mentioned, their output on a daily basis is usually about half of what it should be. So you're going to get um, incorrect results. You need to just do it on a percent basis. So that was one conclusion we drew. Uh, we also showed how variable the models were. We happen to use nine models. Um, each model gives a completely different result and the time periods that they, uh, uh, the days that it rains are all different. Um, so you need to um, develop your statistics for each model individually first and then average them across all nine models. But it is important to use a, an ensemble model because choosing any single model is going to distort your results quite a bit because they are so so variable. Uh, and then the, f the, uh, the third point here, um, you need to develop these delta change factors by season and by storm. And here is a, uh, an output from, um, from our work. Uh, what you see on the left, the yellow is the percentile storm. So the higher percentiles, 98, 99, 100. That means that all storms, 99% uh, of the storms are less than the 99th percentile. So the, the higher numbers on the left, uh, 98, 97, 96, those are the large storms. And then when you go down to the bottom, the five, six, seven percentiles, those are the small storms. Uh, and just to the right of that, the second column, you will see the ensemble averages for the percent increase between current conditions and what will happen at the end of century. Uh, and there's something uh, key to note here. You will see that the larger storms are projected to increase um, quite a bit more than the smaller storms, 12% uh, for the larger storms and about two or 1% for the small ones. Um, next to that, you'll see how variable these models are and why you need an ensemble. Uh, just look at the 100th percentile. You'll see a minimum 
the, the, the one model produced actually a decrease in the precip by 12%, another one 60% increase. So you get this kind of variation and we don't know which model is correct. So we tend to use ensembles. Um, then the green, blue, yellow and gray, uh, those are the seasonal ones. And you can see again, um, all of them have large storm increases projected um, much higher than small storms but by season they uh, they differ quite a bit. So you'll see that um, anywhere from uh, over 20% um, in the uh, spring to a low of uh, 7 per 11% um, in, the, in the fall. Oh no, 4%, I'm sorry, in the summer. So uh, for the largest storm. So you see that there's a tremendous amount of variability and you need to do this kind of work in order to develop these uh, change factors, which we used. Uh, here they are graphically in, in one, uh, one, this is the winter one. You can see again on the, um, on the x-axis, uh, those are the storm size. On the left side are the small storms and on the right side are the large storms. Um, and the delta change factors are the percent increases. And you can see that they uh, almost steadily increase as the storms get larger, reaching up to 20% uh, for these winter storms. So these change factors can help us to transform current Philadelphia gauge time series to future. Um, so here are the basic steps. Um, you take uh, the Philadelphia hourly rain gauge, um, you aggregate it to daily for the uh, current period, 1995 to 2015. We had those uh, delta change factors by season and by storm size um, for that period. We apply them. Um, we interpolate those uh, delta changes for all of the storms. Um, and now we have um, a daily rainfall uh, time series or a group for the 2080-2100 uh, because of those change factors that we used. Then we simply disaggregate back down to the hourly and what we've actually created now is a future hourly precipitation time series that is realistic to the local gauge data. So this was all of what we presented in the first uh, webinar. Um, now the next step uh, that we took um, there was to uh, take a look at um, possible future scenarios and their variation. And to do that, uh, we developed a stochastic weather generator and that is the topic of my talk this afternoon. <clears throat> so let me start by saying why we would actually do a, a stochastic uh, weather generator or rainfall generator. Um, I think we're all used to thinking that rainfall um, that occurred in the past is a, is a given fact. And we work with those statistics all the time. So we think, okay, it, it rained a certain amount each day or each hour between 1950 and 2015 or today. Uh, and that's how it rained and how it, 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 it's a given fact. It's not necessarily um, a variable kind of a thing. Um, but there are two types of variable variability that we do consider. Uh, one, of course, we're used to the fact that every year is a little bit different. There are dry years, wet years, and so forth. So we're used to that, and we're used to taking uh, statistics um, and trying to figure out what their return interval is. So we might say, all right, what's a, this 24-hour storm? How big is a one-year return interval, or how, how, how big is a 100-year return interval? So those are the probabilities of, of you know, having one every, every uh, year or one every 100 years. Um, so we're used to that kind of variability. Uh, and the second one that has in recent years crept in, of course, is this concept that um, our weather patterns and the conditions that are creating them are changing. It's uh, it, our assumption of stationarity in the past where we could take statistics from a period of time uh, in the past and say, well, that's the way it's gonna be in the future, um, probably is no longer uh, viable. And we have to start to consider climate change, which is where we bring into the global climate models uh, to help us analyze that. Um, if you look at this, um, here's the annual precipitation from 1895 right through today. Um, the, the line in the middle is the average precipitation, it's around 44 inches, and you can see the brown is years in which the average was below and green is when it was above. Uh, and it sort of bounced around um, every year. Uh, and cumulatively, that's what the green and the brown are doing. Um, you can see that <clears throat> Most of the beginning of the last century, it was perhaps cumulatively a little under the average. Um, but in recent years, starting in the 70s, <clears throat> it seems to be consistently above average rainfall. So that may be some indication um, that stationarity is, is a problem. 
So going back to the stochastic weather, Jenner, I, I bought my grandson, he's five, a, a book. Uh, and in that book, uh, he was, the book sort of makes the premise that you can place yourself into a, a parallel universe using this fancy little machine, which appealed to the five-year-old. Um, and he can go back and he can become whatever he wants to be, a doctor, a fireman, a pilot, whatever. So he, you know, his life can be relived uh, in, in various ways. Um, and I thought about this and I thought this makes actually kind of an interesting point. Uh, we do have decades and decades of hourly rainfall from uh, the Philadelphia airport gauge. Um, but is that the only way it could have happened? We assume it is, that that's the representation of what weather was over that period. But really, that's not true. It's only just one realization of what could have happened given the conditions of the past decades. It is the one that happened to occur, of course, and that's the one we're used to using for our statistics. But we would need some sort of a parallel universe portal to go back in time and rerun that period, and we would get a different set of rainfall statistics um, altogether. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, here, here's a simple example of, of how this could be tricky for us, for example. Now, take a look at this graph. This is uh, the, uh, the total annual rainfall between 1950 and 2015. Uh, and you can see it's bouncing around that 40 to 44 inch rainfall. It may be slight trends, but it's, it's, very, it's very hard to, to view. And we could say, all right, let's take this uh, as current conditions and we're gonna work off the statistics that are associated with this. Well, let me, let me just pose this, this thing. Let's assume we have three hydrologists and they're looking at this data. Um, but a hydrologist one only has data from 1950 to 1970 and he's asked what the average rainfall is in Philadelphia and he says, well, it's 39.5 inches because that's what his data is telling him. Well, hydrologist two actually only has data from 1970 to 1990 and when he's asked that question, he says, no, 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 it's 43.3 inches per year. And the third one, <clears throat> he has the most recent data, uh, and he says, no, 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 you're all wrong, it's 44.5 inches. All right, so there's three people, um, three different sets of, of information. Um, they all think that they have the right answer, and which, which one is correct, 39 and a half, 43.3, 44.5. Well, really all of the above and none of the above are the correct answer. Um, the estimated average really is a range that includes uncertainty. Uh, we can calculate it using statistics, um, but as I just showed, it would depend very much on the data you choose and the time period that you choose. Your answer will be very, very different. There's no fixed answer. Um, and you might actually, taking a look at the uh, above data, you might actually also detect that non-stationarity creeping in. Um, each successive later time period gave a higher percentage. So uh, maybe what we're seeing is that creeping increase in precipitation that the global climate models are projecting. But let's extend our thinking now and say, all right, but we have an hour by hour record of rainfall at the Philadelphia airport gauge. But really this is, again, it's not a fixed series. It's just another arbitrary time period for what we call current conditions. So if we were able to enter that parallel universe machine and relive the same period, we would see a different set of hourly uh, precipitation conditions. Um, and a different set of statistics. And so that's what a stochastic weather generator will try to do to give us some insight into how that might have occurred in the past, the present, and in the future. Okay, so you wanna build a stochastic weather generator and many people are working on them and they are um, very useful and interesting things to do. Um, most of them uh, work off created probability distributions. Um, so I mentioned that um, you know, we typically calculate, NOAA calculates, <clears throat> and we can look up um, probability distributions for storm volumes. So for example, you can say, all right, uh, a one year, one year, uh, one hour uh, storm, what's the one year probability that would return into of one year? Um, and you can get a number for that and two year and five year. And you can calculate that storm volume off of the record, the period of record um, by doing some statistics on it. And it's not too difficult. And you come up with a probability distribution for a particular storm volume, maybe a 24 hour storm or 12 storm hour storm. And this is relatively straightforward and those statistics are readily available. Um, but um, when you start to think about storms, um, they actually, have a volume, but they also have a 
different duration. So a two inch storm might occur over five hours. It might occur over 18 hours. Um, so we probably need a second probability distribution which considers duration along with volume. Um, so now we've got a joint probability distribution. Okay, not insurmountable. We, we do that sort of thing all the time and we probably could build our generator using this. But the more you think about it, there's another problem here. Um, even if you have a storm with the same duration and the same volume, they all have a different pattern of intensities within that storm. So for example, a 24 hour storm might both have a, a 24 hour duration and they might have both might have rained for two inches, um, but one storm might have dropped most of that in two hours somewhere in the middle whereas another might have drizzled for the whole 24 hours. Both total two inches, but they have completely different effects on an urban uh, water system and any urban water model that you ha would have. So we really need the probability to take into account that. So this is now suddenly becoming a, a difficult problem because there's almost an infinite possible pattern of intensities and now we can need a triple joint probability or a multi-dimensional probability distribution. Um, and then when you're doing urban hydrologic modeling or looking at urban storm systems, um, antecedent conditions also play a role. Was the soil wet? Was the soil dry? Um, and now we're entering a realm of, for me at least, is a statistical nightmare. It's, um, it, it's really, really difficult to develop a generator that's going to produce all of these things um, with, with the joint probabilities in that sense. Um, and so we thought about it and we said, oh, wait a minute, why don't we simply think of the hourly precipit time series as not just a record of what happened, but think of it as a probability set. And what I mean by that is that what happened has a whole range of different storms and all the complex statistical probabilities that I was just describing actually are inherent in that set of data that we actually have. And if we have a sufficiently long period of hourly or sub-hourly rainfall, which we do in Philadelphia and many of these gauges, we will pick up most of the possible complexity of those rainfall events and their statistical distributions. Um, so this then becomes the, uh, the, the uh, approach to our uh, stochastic weather generator. So if we take the Philadelphia hourly time series and we say, okay, we're going to assume 20 years is a sufficiently long period to model current conditions. Here's what we do. We aggregate the wet hours uh, each hour in, in, the, in the gauge that it actually rained um, and we put them into, we create discrete storm events. Uh, you have to choose an inter-event time. In our case, um, we chose six hours. There are techniques for deciding what's the best inter-event time. I, We'll not try to go into that today, but in, in our case, six hours was that. So um, the way this works is any hour in the time series between 1955, January 1st, all the way through uh, December 31st, uh, 2014, any hour where it rained more than a, a hundredth of an inch, we call that a wet hour. And that starts a storm event. And that storm event is tracked uh, until it's fo followed by six or more hours where it did not rain. Uh, if it hits that six hour uh, threshold, um, that ends the storm event and the intervening dry period is then tracked as a dry event. And then the next storm event happens when you get a hundredth of an inch of rainfall. So it looks something like this. This is where we started 1995, January 1st. And it happened to start raining um, around midnight of that day. Um, and that storm lasted uh, about seven hours. Uh, and it rained 0.79 inches. So there you have in our database a particular storm event. Um, but then it was dry for a while. And then the next day around 9 p.m. it started to rain again quite heavily. Um, but we had already had six hours of dry. So the second one becomes a new event, a new storm event. And that one was tracked and that was considerably longer. Um, it started very small. There were some dry events and then it started to rain a lot uh, towards the end. And we ended up with a 1.28 inch storm. Um, so this, we, churn, we churn through the whole 20 year period defining these storm events. Okay, now we have a storm event set and a dry event set. And what I said before was um, the, the, the insight that we had to create the stochastic weather January is to treat these as probability sets. So every storm event is considered one member of this storm probability set. 
and every dry spell is considered a member of the dry probability set. Uh, and what you're going to do is simply pluck out randomly from this set a storm event, then you're going to pluck a dry spell event, and then a, a wet spell event, and so forth and so on until you've created a time series. Uh, it looks something like this. Uh, the stochastic sampler successively picks from each of the sets alternating. Uh, and because um, all of these storms are in there with an equal probability, um, you can you, you get a, a wide variety of storm of events. Um, and then after you've picked your storm event, you pick a dry spell and then you follow that up and you continue to do that until you've reached your desired series length. Um, so you can recreate a new 20 year uh, period um, that's representative of 1995 to 2015. And then you go ahead and do it again and again, and you can do that or 50 or 100 times until you've represented that period uh, with a, a stochastic set of different rainfall um, uh, time series. Um, so we've bypassed the need to develop this multidimensional probability function because we have it inherent in the storm events. Um, you, if you think of the storm set, for example, they all have different volumes, durations, intensities. Uh, and if we assume that that 20 year period is long enough to give us a representative set of these storms, then we've probably covered the, the range of most of the possibilities. And if you think about it, when you look at that storm set, there'll be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, very small storms, because that's the ones that are most frequent, uh, and very few of the really large storms in that 2000 storm event set. Um, so by plucking them with equal probability, you have a very high likelihood of picking a small storm and a low probability of picking the large storm. And, and thus you've got the probability distribution correct. Um, of course, we could use the full 100 year record and actually we did some experiments with that. Um, the advantage is there, it will give you even a wider range of storm volumes, durations, intensities, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but as we mentioned before, that does assume that the 20th century has experienced no climate change related shifts. Um, and so if you're really interested in what we might call current conditions, maybe the last 10 or 20 years, then that's probably not going to give you the right statistics. Uh, you can also select a more recent shorter period. We happen to use the 20 year period, 95 through 2015 at the time. Fewer storms, but still quite a combination, over 2000 of them. Uh, and this actually might be more representative of the climate impacted current conditions. Um, either way, it depends on what you're trying to do, um, but you have those choices. All right, <clears throat> so is this going to work? Uh, we are assuming we can pick randomly from each data set, first a wet event, then a dry event, then a wet event until we reach whatever time period or uh, length of period we want, 20 years or even 100 years. Um, but one of the key assumptions here is that the two events are independent. In other words, if you have a, a, a dry event of a certain duration that does not have any influence on the subsequent duration of the wet event, and vice versa. Well, we checked all the statistics on those uh, correlations and we found that they appeared to be independent. I simply, I'm not going to go through that, but I will just show you the graph of storm event duration versus dry spell duration. And of course, what it, that thing is showing is that there's no relationship whatsoever. You can have a long uh, storm event and a very short dry event following it or vice versa. Um, so we were quite happy with that assumption. Um, the second one, of course, is does the length of time of a dry event have any influence on the subsequent volume of the following storm or vice versa? And again, the statistics showed nothing. And here's the graph of that. And you see no correlation again. Um, you can have a, a long dry spell and a very small storm, or you can have a long dry spell and a very large storm and vice versa. And, and um, it seems to be fairly random. So we were happy that we could pick uh, randomly from these two sets. Um, one other <clears throat> assumption that's a little more subtle. Um, in the first um, webinar, we did talk about the fact that you could do these delta change factors either by um, calculating the, uh, well, you have to use the GCM on a wet day because they don't give an hourly time series. So you, the, um, the percent changes between the current period of record and whatever future period, in our case, I'm, I'm saying 19, uh, 2080 to 2100. Um, 
you can only look at percent changes based on the amount of rainfall that falls on a given day, not by storm. Um, but we wanted to see if we could apply those delta change factors to storms as opposed to wet days from a gauge uh, and whether there would be any difference in our stochastic weather generator results. And we found that they didn't. Um, there are a lot of numbers here, but basically what you're seeing, what I'm showing here is um, in the future, the day-to-day, -day, in other words, if we used um, daily totals from the uh, Philadelphia rain gauge and compared them to the GCM dailies, we got a set of numbers. And if we took the uh, rain gauge data and did the six hour intervent time and created storms and adjusted them upwards and then did the stochastic generator, we got essentially the same numbers across the board. So it didn't really matter. It, it becomes a matter of what's easier <clears throat> statistically for whomever is doing this particular exercise. So another check. If we run the stochastic weather generator multiple times on current data, how, how well does it match uh, and what does it give us? Uh, and what we're looking for here is going back to this idea of the, of the time portal or the time machine or the uh, parallel universe. Um, we would expect if we ran 1995 to 2015 that we would get a range of hourly time series that are quite different. So one might be fairly dry, one might be fairly wet. Um, but we should also expect that the that the average um, um, values uh, that when if we calculate average values that the uh, stochastic runs should um, converge on those average values from the uh, Philadelphia gauge. Um, and indeed, this is exactly what happened. Um, so here's a table which shows uh, in gray on the top um, some values uh, for the period from the Philadelphia gauge. So we have the average annual total. 43.24, these 50 simulation average, 43.37. So you can see it was converging on that. If we went up to 100, it would get even closer. Uh, same for the minimum, the mean event depth, average number of days, almost identical. Uh, mean event duration, seven hours and 7.4, 7.3. So you can see that the stochastic um, is, is uh, converging. Now, a couple of them are in red. Um, and those are the um, single event maximums. And there, there is a slight uh, problem with the stochastic generator. Um, we don't get uh, quite the same. It does not converge. And here's, of course, the reason why. Um, realizing that if we have a probability set from Philadelphia gauge data, it will have the single largest storm, which happens to be 8.27 inches in that period. Um, because that's the probability set, obviously we're not going to be able to pluck a storm larger than that because it doesn't exist. So when you look at the maximum annual total, the convergence of the 50 simulations is going to be slightly underestimating um, that. And of course, if you're looking for a single event, it's not going to go over 8.27. Um, we have solved that problem. You can extend um, your, uh, your probability set by using an extreme value uh, function and add some larger storms to that based on um, the, uh, the gauge data. Um, and you can solve that problem. But um, for the results that I'm showing you here, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't do that. But it is something that you can do to get, get past this problem. OK, um, so here are some results <clears throat> if you want to look at um, how this thing works. Um, this is the result for 50 simulations for current uh, time period. And this is simply the annual total precipitation in any given year. So on the left side, um, what we observed at the Philadelphia gauge um, for that 20 year period. So you have 20 annual totals. You can see the dots faintly. Uh, and then we've calculated the mean is 43.24. Um, now we run our uh, weather generator. We have 50 simulations of 20 years. Um, so we actually have a thousand points now. So you can see there's a lot of blue dots there. Um, and you can see that they range higher and lower than what we got in the uh, Philadelphia gauge because we've got a weather generator that will take a look at this and give us a broader range of possible annual totals than we actually got. Again, that's that, that concept that what we had in the, the 20 years was not necessarily the only realization of what could have happened. But you see that the mean is, is, is quite accurately reproduced again um, with the stochastic weather generator. So here we have this variability. We're beginning to see the, the value of this. If we do it <clears throat> by season, we get similar results. Again, the left side of each of those, what's that seasonal uh, uh, 
20 year uh, annual for that particular um, gauge. And then on the right of each of those, the stochastic generator, which obviously makes a lot more data points and spreads out and gives us a much broader range of potential seasonal totals. Um, but remember, this um, weather generator is actually producing an hourly time series, which is um, um, going to be really, really important, as you'll see in a second. Um, so if we, if we go back to what I described in webinar one, um, the series adjustment method, we can, we can adjust our time series using those delta change factors to create a future probability set. So we have the 1995 hourly time series from Philadelphia Gage. Um, the stochastic generator can take what we produced as a future hourly time series for a 20 year period and do exactly the same thing, uh, generate a variety of future time series. So here's the way it looks in a little graphic. Um, we have created a time series from 28 to 2100 using those delta change factors <clears throat> and re-aggregating the Philadelphia uh, in, uh, gauges from the daily uh, back down to disaggregating them back to uh, hourly time series or even 15 minute if we have them. And now we have a future time series. Um, then we do exactly the same thing. We create a storm probability set, a dry spell probability set, and then we can stochastically generate hourly time series for the period 2080, 2100. You can do that 50 or 100 times. Um, and that will uh, be used. And we could actually turn that 20 year time series into a 100 year time series if we want to investigate a longer time period. And um, what's that actually saying? What we would be saying is, for example, let's say that the, um, the world gets its act together and by 2080, 2100 has controlled greenhouse gases to the extent that 2080, 2100 stabilizes and becomes the new stable climate. Um, then we could say, all right, well, we, now we have 20 years of that. We can extend that out to 100 years because it's stable and get a sense of what the variability might be over that period for a new stationary climate. Um, I'm not that hopeful that that will happen, but of course that's what we could do and, and use the weather simulator to investigate. So here's some uh, examples of uh, what the uh, weather generator produces for the future compared to the current. So there's the Philadelphia gauge, uh, 43 annual uh, inches. Um, the weather generator stabilized around a mean of about 48 inches per year. So that's what it's projecting the future 2080, 2100. Uh, 2100 uh, time period to look like. Um, but you can see um, that um, you can say that uh, that future time period could be actually as low as an increase of only an inch uh, to about 44.8 inches, but it could go as high as 52 inches. Uh, you look over on the right, the mean event depth, um, that's just um, how much it rains on average for each storm event. <clears throat> you can see that it goes from 0.4 to point to uh, 0.41 to 0.46 uh, with a range of about 0.43 to 0.5 inches um, in the future. So we are beginning to see what the, uh, what the ranges are and what we can project. Uh, it's a little more dramatic for some of the annual totals. Um, we project, um, the, the global climate models project that uh, the rainfall will go from a maximum of 64 to up, upwards of almost 71 inches. Um, but when you run our simulator, um, we can see that that can range anywhere from 52 to a high of 76. So if you think that we are now seeing uh, the maximum that we've ever seen at 64 and it could get as high as 76, you begin to see um, why we need to investigate these extremes. Um, similar for the minimums um, and the maximum event size. So um, again, the simulation, the simulator gives us um, a, a range and we can begin to actually begin to think a little bit about 10th and 90th percentiles and things like that. So what can we do with this? Okay, <clears throat> well, the first thing is, since we now have an hourly time series or even a sub hourly time series, we can actually take those future ones and we can look at minimums, maximums, 90th, 10th percentile, and we can plug them directly into an H&H &H model and explore the impacts of climate change on urban stormwater flooding, sewer capacity, and so forth. Um, and as I said, with the stochastic weather generator, we can begin to look a little bit about the statistical range of that as well. So if we're going to be making probability decisions or decisions and we wanna know how conservative we need to be, um, this becomes very valuable. 
Um, but we can also def de develop intensity duration frequency curves for the future, and we can put an envelope on them of percentiles, 10th and 90th and so forth. Um, and of course, that's very, very valuable if you're designing something like a, uh, a combined sewer overflow tunnel where you're gonna be investing a, hundreds of millions of dollars and you wanna get it right and you might wanna be conservative and perhaps they can take the 90th percentile <clears throat> with a future estimate as opposed to the 10th or the median. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's how this might look. And this is a set <clears throat> of IDF curves um, with the, uh, <clears throat> the future and the current. Um, and what it's showing is the recurrence interval on the x-axis. So there's the 10-year 10, 10 recurrence interval, 20, 30, all the way up to 100. And on the y-axis, the number of inches associated with that. Um, and then each of the different colored lines are a different storm duration. So these are typical IDF curves um, that you'll see. Um, so the, the solid lines might be the ones from NOAA. Uh, for the one hour, the red, a two hour storm would be the blue, uh, the three hour storm would be the green, the purple is a six hour storm, the orange is a 12, yellow is a 24 and a 48. And you can get the average intensities in inches per hour for each one of those storms. And that's available from NOAA, it's also something that we calculated. But now we took our time series that we created um, and we uh, generated off the mean uh, uh, future estimate, uh, and those are the dotted ones. And you can see how the uh, IDF curves shift upwards uh, in 2080 to 2100 as the storms become more intense. Um, so this might look something like this where the 100 year storm was about a little under 2.7, or about 2.7 inches. Um, <clears throat> now um, <clears throat> in 2080, 2100, that 100 year storm is now somewhere between a 50 and a 60 year uh, recurrence interval. So you can see the shift as climate change um, has its effect on, uh, on the recurrence interval of these storms. So these IDF curves can then be used in your designs. Uh, the last projection, um, this one's a little complicated. What the, uh, the gray and the dark line in the gray, um, that is the actual current IDF curve. Um, I believe it's for a one hour storm. Yes, one hour duration storm. Again, the average recurrent of its interval is on the bottom of the x-axis. Uh, and in the y-axis intensity, this intensity in this case is it's a millimeter per hour. I pulled this from our, pre our, our uh, publication. Um, so you can see what the current <clears throat> IDF curve looks like. Um, but now we used our uh, weather generator to look what that current IDF curve might have been as a maximum or a minimum. And those are those lightly dotted lines. So you see it could have been a, a much lower intensity or a much higher intensity uh, had we gone back and relived that period of 1900 to 2015, 100 times or 50 times. Um, and then we shifted it up to the future. And those are the more dashed lines and you can see the shift upwards. So in the future, the minimum IDF curve for the one hour storm um, almost lines up with what we currently consider is the, uh, the one hour storm, whereas the maximum is significantly higher. So again, you can look at the 10th and the 90th percentiles and begin to make use of that in figuring out how much, of what your risk tolerance is and which, uh, which percentile or, or whether you wanna go with the median or uh, a more um, unlikely uh, future wet storm or a more unlikely future dry uh, condition. So some conclusions um, from webinar one, <clears throat> the delta change approach uh, gave us uh, good cumulative frequency distributions uh, that conserved the local rainfall patterns, but gave us future um, estimates by storm size and by season. <clears throat> the stochastic weather generator gives us the opportunity to examine the ranges uh, and the variety of uh, potential future rainfall. Um, we can also create multiple time series of any length in the future uh, for uh, modeling purposes. And we can also um, <clears throat> look at IDF curves um, and look at their variety in the future and in the current uh, period to, uh, to estimate uh, probabilities of, of things occurring in the future uh, and our tolerance for, for our risk associated with them. Um, it can also be applied um, for sub hourly time series, and we, were, we will be doing that for a number of the Philadelphia gauges in the future. 
So with that, that wraps up this presentation. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to Corin to handle the questions. And if I can answer them, I'll do my best. What you're looking at here is the ASCE journal article uh, that we published um, on this particular subject matter. Um, and you're welcome to uh, purchase that, I guess, or if you have access to it, to read it. Corin? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left for Q&A. And again, if you want to ask a question, there's a Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen where you can type in questions, or if you'd like to ask a question verbally, you can um, hit the raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen and I can unmute you to ask a question. Uh, we did get a question earlier um, from Phil, if there's any difference between, if you're seeing any difference between mean and median uh, in your simulation results. Just a little bit, just a little bit, not, <clears throat> I always try to use a little bit of common sense because you, you will see small changes. Um, and then if you think of the overall uncertainty of the global climate models and everything we're doing with and the scenarios, uh, you have to sort of say, okay, those are the same numbers, even though they're slightly different. So no, we didn't see a huge difference. Are there other questions? I can fill one in if, if we're wait, while we're waiting. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so Mark, really nice work. Um, I, we've also explored, um, these stochastic weather generators and I was wondering, um, if I understood your process, you ignored seasonality. In other words, you randomly picked wet and dry events regardless of season. Although there was that one plot where you showed seasonal, um, comparison. And I was wondering, um, did you? Oh, that, no, that's a good point, Franco. Actually, I should have said that we we actually did break it into seasons and and ran ran them individually and then reconfirmed it. I actually had forgotten that. <laughs> I'm glad you reminded me. We Great. did. We so did. there was a moving. So to some extent, your sampling wasn't um, random throughout the year. You had no. It was seasonally throughout. randomly uh, selected. I need to adjust my presentation. Um, I forgot that. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> okay. And just tying into one of the questions that was last asked um, last year, I mean, last week, um, you could, I guess in that, um, you could indicate whether it was snow or rain, right? Because you have that in the, in the gauge data, if it was, if it came as, you know, water equivalents or if it was actually mm -hmm. water. So you could actually, using this method, predict changes in snow patterns as well. It was, you didn't mention it, but I'm guessing you could do that if you just retained that marker as to whether it was the precipitation was rain or snow. Yes, so that's a good point. Yes, you could. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, the global climate models actually attempt to um, estimate when it's snow versus rain too. They use different methods. Sometimes they simply look at the, the surface in the layer closest to the, the land. Uh, others use slightly more sophisticated attempts. So they actually do rain and snow as well. Um, as I said, in Philly, the snow is fairly insignificant amount. So we didn't bother with it uh, in this particular application. But yes, if we headed up to Boston, for example, and we're doing this, yeah, we might want to consider that as well. Okay. We have a, a couple questions. Um, and I also just want to mention, um, because this was asked, the this presentation um, has uh, is being recorded and a link to this webinar will be available on the work, uh, the, the webinar page where you can also register for the upcoming webinars. And you'll also get a link to the recorded webinar and a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so a question from Karen, did you try to address ongoing changes? That is given that we are increasing emissions globally, we expect more and accelerating changes. How might you capture ongoing shifts in variability and intensity, wet and dry? Well, that's what the delta change method will do. So we, we actually produce them for um, various periods. I just showed you 2080 to 2100, but we obviously can do it um, up until there. That's um, actually some of the global climate models are now projecting further out and we could, we could use that as well. Um, and we also, um, we, we, um, we looked at delta change factors for the, a couple of the scenarios, uh, you know, the, um, RCP 8.5, 4.5, 2.6, and so forth. Um, so yes, um, that goes back to the first webinar. Uh, whichever change factors you decide and whichever scenarios you select, you would run through the same process um, and, and do this. Um, right now in Philadelphia, um, Julia, Rob, uh, Julia Rockwell and her team have 
focused on uh, RCP 8.5, which is the most uh, conservative of the uh, projections are the most dire um, for most of their um, work um, at the moment. Um, but there's no reason why, why we would be limited to that. Okay. Um, oh, and follow up. So if you'd capture observed 1995 to say 2130, you'd get the same curves? Uh, mm, say that again. Sorry. Uh, if you'd, if you kept, if, um, sorry, if you'd capture Sorry, can you see can you see this question, Mark? Uh, no, let me stop sharing. That that would make sense. Okay. Um, and that's on the on the chat thing here. The Q and A box. Q and A box. Ah. So if you'd capture observe ninety five to say twenty thirty, you'd get the same. Uh, no, you'd probably get slightly different curves. We went to uh, twenty fifteen, but twenty thirty. Um, would capture presumably more intense rainfall and your curves would change again. So again, that, that was the point of my initial one where I had the three hydrologists. Depending on the time period you choose, you're always going to get a different answer. And so that's always one of the, the major questions is what time period would, do we choose? Uh, and that's kind of where the, uh, the discussion is about non-stationarity and whether we can prove that the last 10 years or 20 years have proven that climate change is occurring on, on the precipitation side. And one of the problems is it's so incredibly variable as our generator shows and, and the, actually the, the last hundred years show. Um, it's still fairly hard to tease out that trend statistically, although most of us all agree that it is there. Okay, um, from Ziwen, for the independence of event duration, it might not hold for different seasons. A seasonal factor could also be important in building up the pool for sampling events in stochastic process. Yes, um, as I said, I forgot that we did this through, through the seasonally and we did not see that uh, dependence. Um, there might be a little bit confusion. Um, a lot of these uh, stochastic generators or the, 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 the downscaling that they use um, looks at um, the dependence of um, an hour followed by another hour. Uh, so in other words, what's, what's the statistical probability that a wet hour will follow a previous wet hour or a previous dry hour? And there, there is a strong correlation. Um, but once you um, aggregate all of those into these storm events, um, that link seems to be broken um, and it becomes um, not correlated. I think these next two questions are, are somewhat related, so I'm going to ask them together. Um, are there any worries and variances due to different geographical regions, uh, locations for data gathered? And then another question, um, Meso West and uh, NWS Northwest South, Northwest South have thousands of weather stations with five minute data. There is some concern about sub-hourly precipitation becoming more intense. Any thoughts of using these data sets? Oh, and absolutely. National Weather Service, sorry. A National Weather Service. Absolutely. Um, we also have five-minute data uh, in Philly, which we um, are, will be using as well. And as I said, the, the method in both um, um, <clears throat> in both uh, the webinars, um, it's an aggregation dis disaggregation. So you have to aggregate up to a daily to get the change factors, but you can aggregate five minutes just as well as uh, um, one hour, uh, and then you can re-disaggregate uh, back down to your five minutes. So yes, this this um, system works perfectly well um, at five minute data. Uh, as for the geographic differences, um, theoretically, I think it should work. Um, the only thing you might have to adjust, and we do have a procedure for that, which I didn't talk about today, is if the um, the global climate models are projecting a, a, a significant change in the number of weather events per year. Um, you would have to take that into account. Um, we do have an idea of how to do that, but we didn't need to uh, in Philly because um, when we looked at the uh, global climate models, um, they were showing about 104 wet events per year on average now and right through the future. All the, all the future scenarios had about the same number. So we didn't need to worry about that. But um, if, you, if there is a significant change, say it's gonna rain more or less um, in terms of not just intensity, but number of storms, um, you would need to adjust um, your, your, uh, your data sets a little bit, but there is a way of doing that. Mark, this is Franco. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in a place where you have highly seasonal precipitation, you know, where you could accidentally pick 
you know, um, so let's say you pick a dry period that happens to last for two months <clears throat> mm -hmm. and you do that on the last day of, um, let's say that you, you know, your summer, what you're de designating as your summer season, if it's fixed in terms of dates, <clears throat> then you could, I could see how there could be some significant uncertainty introduced in the weather generator that's not in the historical record, right? Yeah. But I mean, one way of thinking about that might be to do kind of a moving window. Uh, I, I, so I was curious when you did the seasonality, did you, um, you know, did you pick the traditional dates of the seasons and only, and then when you're at the edges, you kind of had an abrupt sharp shift to a different data set or did you kind of transition uh, by moving the window forward in time? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, we, we did address that because you're absolutely right. You could have a, let's say a, a dry period or a storm that's, you know, goes from whatever March, uh, I guess, March 30th to April 1st or something like that. And yes, um, we, we experimented with a few things there. Uh, one was just to leave it alone and then start the new, the new uh, seasons probability set after that storm or dry period ended. Um, we also looked a little bit at cutting it off. In other words, if it was a, a rainstorm or event, we would just cut it off. Um, we, we opted for the first one because we didn't like cutting off storms. Um, we didn't mind so much the dry periods, but cutting off a storm bothered us a little bit, but yes, you have to pay attention to that. And I would imagine, although I haven't, we haven't tried this in a, you know, like a place that's like has monsoons and dry periods. Um, you would probably have to be a little bit more sensitive to that um, and look at the edges and maybe uh, make some make some decisions about that. Um, we decided to leave it alone because it, it, first of all, it didn't have a huge effect on our results, but also um, we felt uncomfortable cutting off a storm arbitrarily just because of a date. Right. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that edge between seasons and particularly if the seasons are quite dramatic, uh, much more than, than we're used to in the Northeast, um, I would definitely pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good point. And a note from Phil, who lives near Portland, Oregon. He said his weather station registered uh, 4.72 inches per hour of rainfall rate in December 2019. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, we probably only have a couple of minutes left, but um, just a quick question uh, to folks in the Northeast who might be interested in actually accessing these these uh, time series that you've generated, are these, um, does PWD make these available to the community, to the practicing community or are, are these sort of for internal purposes at this point? Right now they're for internal purposes. They're having internal discussions about exactly what to do about this because they are getting all kinds of requests. <laughs> um, and um, Julia's team is not exactly sure right now um, what the official Philadelphia's position is in this. She's trying to get an answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going up through the commissioner and then even through the mayor's office of sustainability, what, what, what's, what should they be offering um, up in terms of, you know, and there's two questions of that, you know, it, it, it costs them a, a certain amount of work um, to, 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 to make this stuff available. And, you know, their time is, is limited. And the other is, you know, are there any, ramifications for the water department producing this kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but right now it's still internal, but um, I think they're going to figure something out. And, and at some point um, that question will be answered. And have you looked, uh, because I know the city has official projections for the future in terms of changes in, I think it's annual precipitation, but it may also have changes in the numbers of extreme events. And I know CC run has developed um, those stats for Philadelphia Mm -hmm. I know we have Dan Bader on the call who was part of generating those, but have you compared what you've gotten through this technique with some of the other forecasts for future precipitation in this area? Yes, yes, we always do that and we always run up with the same familiar problem. Um, the numbers are always a little different and then you start to look why and then because they used a different time period or a different model, a set of model, uh, uh, models and so forth. Um, but essentially, um, very similar very similar across the board. Um, but it's never the same. Um, and, you know, you, 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 
it's irritating when you're when you're working with the numbers because it's like ah oh, you know we're gonna have to explain this now and then you look into it and they say okay well the, you know they use these years we didn't use those years and so forth and so on there's always a reason but it's um, that's why I say a, a fair amount of common sense um, you can get hung up if you know in tenths of an inch uh, and then if you take a a, a step back um, and realize that you know these global climate models are you know the, the range is ridiculous. Uh, you, you should sort of take a deep breath and not, not, get, not get too hung up on that. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, I think we're out of time, but thanks again, uh, Mark, for a second really illuminating webinar. Oh, my pleasure. And I will, I see a question here that somebody's gonna practice their clarinet when done. I, I'll do the same. Um, <laughs> <Michelle>. <laughs> okay. Uh, to all of you listening audience, please join us for our next webinar. Uh, Dr. Ziwen Yu from University of Florida will talk also about a weather generator um, and also about GCMs in a slightly different approach. So um, this should be an interesting follow on to this discussion. So we'll see you next time. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you.